Good evening. Um, after the crisis, prosperity and sustainability in the green economy, it's the title of Tim Jackson's uh, lecture tonight, and we are extremely excited to have him here during the WWTBD What Would Thomas Bernard Do Festival. Tim Jackson is Professor of Sustainable Development at the University of Surrey and Director of Resolve, Research Group of Lifestyles and Values and Environment. He also directs the follow-on project, the Sustainable Lifestyles Research Group. In April 2000, he was appointed as Professor of Sustainable, Sustainable Development at Surrey. Uh, the first such chair to be created in the UK. Tim Jackson held a research fellowship on the social psychology of sustainable consumption supported by the Economic and Social Research Council's Sustainable Technologies Program. His monograph, Motivating Sustainable Consumption from 2005, drawing on Research from, the, from that period is still widely cited in both academic and policy circles and was, influential, was very influential in framing the changing behaviors chapter in the 2005 UK Sustainable Development Strategy. During the last decade, he has held numerous research and policy initiatives in sustainable consumption and production in the UK and worldwide. Tim's research interests have focused on the relationship between lifestyle, well-being, and the environment. He has pioneered both quantitative and qualitative aspects of the relationship between people's lifestyles, uh, societal values, and the environment. For over 20 years, Tim Jackson has been at the forefront of research on the relationship between economic growth and the environment. During the 1990s and 2000s, he worked extensively on the development of adjusted national accounts, green GDP, at both national and regional level. He has also written extensively on the conceptual and empirical dimension of the relationship between economic growth, well being, and sustainability. Connected to WWTBD Festival's dedication to multidisciplinarity, as well as the overreaching concept of the festival as a sort of theater play, it seems most fitting that, in addition to his scientific work, Tim Jackson is also an award-winning play, playwright with numerous BBC radio credits to his name something what we don't have in the German-speaking world. You know, the academics are widely known through, through uh, radio and TV. <clears throat> His 30-episode environmental drama series, Cry of Bittern, won, in, won a 1997 Public Awareness of Science Drama Award. The Language of Flowers, a drama documentary about the life and work of the 80s, 18th century poet Christopher Smart won the 2004 Prix Marolique. Tim's most recent play, Variations, written around a Beethoven sonata of the same name, won the 2007 Grand Prix Marolique and was longlisted for the 2008 Drama Awards. Today, Jackson will be speaking about the possibility of the radical revision of materialistic orient oriented economics, looking at our current economic system that is still based on the equation growth equals, prosperity equals a secure standard of living. Touching on concepts as established in, in his book, Prosperity Without Growth, economist for a Finite Planet, one of the most influential publications on post-growth economics. Jackson will discuss specific considerations for a sustainable economy and the vision of a more just society within the existing ecological limitations. 
Jackson's approach avoids ideological and proposes administrative solutions to a broad group of social economic problems. From the perspective of people in the arts, one of the reasons why we invited, we invited him, this raises the question about what role culture plays in the realm of future social change. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, thank you very much, and um, uh, thanks for the invitation to Vienna. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I think I should say before we start that if you feel that you would like to move around, particularly as I'm showing some slides on this side and there is so much space, then please feel free to do so. And certainly, um, if, you, if you find your view impeded, or if you, if you feel like expressing yourself in motion, um, that's absolutely allowed. I am a professor, as Nikolaus said. And looking to my right, I see that I fall somewhere between sycophants and posers. Um, I suppose it could have been worse. I could have been between creeps and assholes. But I like to think of myself somewhere between brutal schemers and kind souls. And as a, a theme for um, my talk, this evening, it's, it's not a bad place to start. The question that I start with is a very simple one. How is it possible to grow an economy forever when the planet itself is so relentlessly finite? And although it sounds like a simple question, it's a question you're almost not allowed to ask in politics, in business, in, in, um, in government, in all sorts of places, it's a difficult question to ask. But the most extraordinary thing about this question is that though you start with a simple question that looks like it's about physics, geography, geology, you end up looking at questions that are of a much deeper nature, like who are we? What are we doing here? What's the point of it all? And I think this is, a, this is a set of questions that actually would appeal, would have appealed to Thomas Bernhardt. In fact, I want to start my um, discussion of after the crisis, the point in the middle of 2008 where the whole thing looked about to go up in flames. I want to start it really by grounding it in something that Bernhardt said at one point in time, um, a quote that I really like. Es ist alles lächerlich, wenn man an den Tod denkt. It is all pointless, it's all ridiculous when one contemplates death. And in the spirit of that, you might think I'm wandering far from my territory here. This afternoon I went to the Vienna Central Friedhof um, and spent a little bit of time um, thinking, contemplating death. And it's not something that we do every day, it's not something we should do every day, and yet it can be a rather informative thing to do. Informative in this case because uh, I went, we went, myself and uh, a colleague here, to see uh, this particular grave, which is the grave, I'm sure you know, and you've been there many times yourselves, it's the grave of, of one of uh, Vienna's most famous sons, the grave of, of uh, Ludwig Boltzmann. Ludwig Boltzmann was a physicist who lived around the turn of the, of the 20th century, died in 1906. And his biggest contribution to physics was the second law of thermodynamics, which is expressed in mathematical terms. And you'll see, if you look carefully at the top of the picture, it's actually at the top of his gravestone. S equals K log W. Now, I don't expect you necessarily to know what that means. I won't test you on it later, but if I was to give you a really simple explanation of the second law of thermodynamics, it would go something like this. The most likely state of the world is chaos. It is the most probable thing to happen. 
The second law of thermodynamics says that high quality energy continually degrades until it becomes low quality energy, incapable of doing any more work. And this is the process of the universe to continually degrade from high quality to low quality energy. The most likely state of the world is chaos. When Boltzmann was inaugurated as professor of philosophy in the University of Vienna in 1905, odd to appoint a professor of physics as a professor of philosophy, but it's interdisciplinarity that is our theme, so why not? Uh, he gave a lecture in that inaugural ceremony, and it was the title of the lecture was uh, an explanation of the entropy law and of love by means of probabilistic reasoning. It was an extraordinary lecture to give. No text of it survives. There are little bits and pieces we can construct what he was saying. But it seems as though what he was trying to say was that in spite of this, in spite of the fact that the most likely state of the world is chaos, you can create some form of order out of chaos. You can, and we do create order out of chaos. Life itself emerges out of chaos. It emerges out of the continual degradation of high quality energy to low quality energy and the creation of orders, opening structures like flowers blooming in the wilderness of the second law of thermodynamics. And it's a wonderful association for Boltzmann then to go further than this and to say actually the most precious things in our lives, love itself, is in some sense a consequence of the unlikely emergence of order out of the chaos of thermodynamics. Boltzmann's life actually was rather tragic. Only less than a year or so after that lecture, um, he committed suicide. And uh, it was tragic for him, it was tragic for his family, it was tragic for his students. One of those students was a young physicist called Erwin Schrödinger. And Schrödinger took up these ideas that actually life itself emerges, it's an emergent property of a thermodynamic system in which order emerges out of chaos. Beautiful things emerge out of the void, out of the nothingness, through the grace of this process of degradation of high quality to low quality energy. Schrodinger wrote a book in 1945 called What is Life, which traced this emergence of order out of chaos. He was very influential in a school of physicists called the Brussels School, um, uh, dominated by a physicist called Ilya Progiginke. And he, in his turn, taught as a student a man called Georgescu Rogan. Georgescu Rogan was a master of the idea uh, that the environment itself actually has to be ruled by the laws of sec the second law of thermodynamics in particular. And one of his students was a man called Herman Daly, who was the first to write a book arguing that we should aim for a steady state economy rather than a continually growing one. Because, why? because order is purchased at a price. Because the things that we love have a cost. And the cost is the entropy, the disorder that's created as we build the things that we love out of the materials around us. Herman Daly was um, one of my heroes, really. He, he was an economist at the World Bank, and he stood out for this idea that actually, in a finite world, we have to think about an economy that isn't growing all the time. And that's not to suggest, of course, that, that, that growth is in, in all places a bad thing. In some places, it's obviously good. It made our lives better in the Western rich, and eco rich economies. It made things possible our grandparents couldn't even dream of. It's still in the process of making things better in the poorest parts of the world. And all the evidence tells us that it's in those poor parts of the world where growth really makes a difference. It improves the quality of lives of ordinary people in countless ways. It gives them longer life expectancy. It reduces infant mortality. It increases the participation in education. It even makes people in low-income countries measurably happier to have that increase in income. 
But then it begins to tail off. In the richer countries, it doesn't have the same profound effect. It doesn't increase happiness, particularly happiness has stayed more or less flat for three or four decades in most developed countries. It doesn't now bring down our infant mortality, and in fact some countries with a fraction of the income of Western countries have lower rates of infant mortality than many Western economies. Cuba, Costa Rica, Chile, countries with, with incomes of six to 10,000 pounds have achieved remarkable things in terms of social well-being. And yet, in the materialist, rich countries of the West, we're withdrawing social investment. We're concentrating on a consumer economy. We're consuming more and more stuff. And our politicians still tell us we have to have growth. We have to have growth back. I think, um, that, and I would agree, that if Thomas Bernhard were addressing that question, he would say, why the crap? Why do we have to have this growth? What is the point of it? And this isn't an entirely empty question. It's not a trivial question. It turns out that actually sustainability and economics fit for purpose is a real challenge. And it's a real challenge because it sits across a huge dilemma. And the dilemma looks something like this. Growth is unsustainable. All of what we're looking at in terms of growth is a huge throughput of material stuff that is destroying the quality of the planet. But on the other hand, degrowth, if we were to call it that, in French it's called décroissance, which almost sounds like something you'd like for breakfast, and is in the French a much more attractive commodity, a part of a social history that's engaged in this debate more fully than some of the Anglo-Saxon countries. But degrowth, whatever the name that you call it, décroissance, tends towards instability in the economy. Our economies, as they're structured, don't like degrowth. And of course, if you want any evidence at all of that, all you have to do is to think about what happened in the crisis. In the crisis, growth slowed down a bit. People stopped spending money on the streets. That meant there was less demand for goods to be produced in factories. That meant there was less demand for people to work in factories to produce those goods. That meant there was higher unemployment. That meant there was less income to spend on the street and less taxes for government. That meant that governments had to go deeper and deeper into debt just to keep the whole system going. So it is a profound dilemma. It's a dilemma that demands us to think about it carefully and asks us to, to be truly visionary in relation to solutions, but never to forget the depth of the challenge that we're faced with. Our best, or at least our best, most accepted response to that challenge is an appeal to how clever we are. And of course, we are a clever species. One of the things that the second law of thermodynamics bequeathed to us was an intellect of some ingenuity that has allowed us to develop a lot of clever technologies. And a lot of those clever technologies could, in fact, reduce the carbon that's going into the atmosphere. They could reduce the need for fossil fuels. They could reduce the material intensity of our lives. They could create the services that we need to improve our lives with less emphasis on material throughput. We could have, if you like, a circular economy, a clean economy, an efficient economy, a resource productive economy. And these are very good ideas. But I want you just to take a look at the heroic nature of the numbers involved in such a transition. This is a, a graph that shows the carbon intensity of each dollar of, of, of economic activity in the world. And I want you to imagine for a, a moment a world in which, which everybody, 9 billion people by 2050, according to the UN's projections, could aspire to the income levels that we in the West expect and hope to have by 2050. And I want you to also imagine 
that in this equal world, we also achieve our environmental targets. We achieve, in particular, our target in relation to carbon in the atmosphere, which is to reduce it by over 80% globally in that period to avoid the kind of impacts that we know climate change could have. And then I want to ask the question, what does that mean for technology if we still have to have 2% growth per annum in everybody's income, even in the richest countries? And the answer is in the graph. On the left-hand side, this is the carbon intensity of each dollar of economic activity just before the crisis. And if you wanted that equal world, if you wanted everybody to have that $50,000 per capita income by 2050, for 9 billion people and still meet your carbon targets, you would need to be here on the right-hand side of my graph. It's a 130-fold improvement over the carbon intensity at the moment, and it's further, faster, harder, deeper than anything we have ever achieved historically. And it turns out you have to keep going past 2050 because the economy is still growing, so that by 2100, actually, you need to have carbon dioxide less than zero. Nobody really knows what that means. There, isn't, there aren't technologies that really have negative carbon emissions, except for agriculture, permaculture, forestation, and the things that we've been getting rid of as fast as we can. So this is, by any account, a very, very different economy. No politician, no economist, no industrialist, no CEO anywhere can tell you what an economy looks like when it's taking carbon out of the atmosphere instead of putting carbon into the atmosphere. Now, this to me is an interesting point. I, I don't want to stand here and say to you that this is impossible. In fact, particularly to those of you who are younger with your careers in front of you interested in economics, technology and change, this is a challenge. This is a challenge to reorient our economies and to create cleaner, greener, more sustainable economies. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is not so much is it technically possible, but is it possible in this kind of society? So I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about the kind of society uh, that we're in, which this graphic actually captures in, in a, a lovely way in its characterization of the different personality traits that the human being can adopt at various times. I want to ground that a little bit though in economics, not too much. I want to sketch very, very quickly roughly what an economy looks like, and it's a complex beast. It's a circular flow of firms producing goods for people, providing them with incomes to buy more goods, and then people saving some of their money to invest in those firms so they can increase the productivity with which we're doing all this. And it is an interesting system because it drives itself forward by lowering costs, lowering prices, and by pursuing novelty, by ever looking for new stuff to excite us with. It's a process that Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction. Capitalism progresses through throwing over the old continually in favor of the new. And the interesting point about this is that it connects very strongly to a logic in us. As people, all of these people, we like new stuff. We like new things. We like new gadgets. We like new experiences. We like new holidays in the sun, we like new cars, we like new houses, we like new, we like novelty, we even like, occasionally like, new ideas. And this pursuit of novelty actually becomes a part of the social logic that drives this system forward. We are, and the system likes us to be, novelty-seeking consumers out for the things that make our lives richer. And here is a system that delivers us to us. The trouble is, of course, it delivers it in a way that pays no attention to the environment. Where is the environment in this wonderful economic model? It doesn't even exist. It doesn't show you that resources are being taken out of the ground, processed in dirty factories, thrown into the waste dumps, and end up in the climate, in the oceans, in the soils, and we end up with deforested lands, we end up with over-polluted seas and lakes, we end up with drinking water that we can't drink. And the whole thing is absent from this wonderful picture of 
the economy. It's an economy, if you like, an economics for an infinite planet. This might work if the second law of thermodynamics didn't hold. This might be okay if physics was different, but it isn't different, and we should not allow ourselves ever to believe that we can escape our understandings, our best understandings of how the world works. This is a system that is run on two very interesting things. One is, is credit, the provision of loans by commercial banks to consumers so that they can keep on spending, the provision of loans to firms so that they can keep on investing, the provision of loans to the financial sector itself so that it can keep on speculating, gambling, playing a big casino on the financial system. And this, of course, this was one of the primary reasons for the financial system's collapse. People were encouraged to take out loans they could never repay. As they defaulted on those loans, the housing market, housing prices collapsed. As the housing prices collapsed, the asset values on the banks collapsed. The banks found themselves in difficult situations. They'd done too much speculation and not enough guaranteeing of deposits. And so you have a financial crisis. And they'd done it by hiding a lot of these assets in ways that even they could not understand. It was a system built on credit, designed almost like a train crash waiting to happen. The second part of this system, the second driver of this system that I want to draw attention to is anxiety. This was what consumers were doing just prior to the crisis. Personal debt, this was the UK, but other countries are not dissimilar. Personal debt had risen to over 100% of the GDP uh, by the time the crisis hit. And the savings ratio, the point at which people are putting aside money to save, had dropped below zero. This was a, this was a society that was maxing out its credit cards, was continually borrowing more, it was being persuaded to spend money it didn't have on things it didn't need to impress people that they probably didn't even like. It was a system perverse in its incentives, purely in order to keep a system of consumption going. Where does that anxiety live? Where does it come from? What is its essence? Is it structurally embedded in, in the way that enterprise works? Is it something in our hearts and souls? Is it a mixture of those things? Actually, it turns out it is a kind of mixture of those things. So the anxiety of the firm is that if you don't engage in this cycle of relentless novelty seeking, relentless new products and markets, you will lose shareholder value. Your shareholders will go somewhere else. They'll take their money to another place, another firm, another country that engages in it. The anxiety in us is something that 200 years ago, Adam Smith himself recognized. He called it the desire to live a life without shame. All of us have a desire to live a life without shame. All of us have a desire to be decent citizens. The new gadgets matter to us partly because they're cool. They really do offer functionality but partly because they show those around us that we are decent citizens, that we have the right stuff. We have the right trainers, we have the right phone, we have the right iPad, the right touchpad, we go on the right holidays. We have everything around us that shows other people that we are decent human beings. It matters. This life without shame actually matters to us. It touches the deepest parts of our soul. And it isn't just, as Adam Smith said, way back then about having the right shirt. A linen shirt, said Adam Smith, was the garment for the want of which you would not show your face in public. Today it's a whole basket of commodities and we all know about them. The electronic gadgets, the clothes that we wear, the houses we live in, everything around us is signifying this life without shame. And it isn't a trivial conversation. Consumerism itself touches on the heart of who we are as human beings. It's an odd thing to contemplate, 
But there was an anthropologist called Mary Douglas who died a couple of years ago. And this is a wonderful quote. It's from an essay on poverty. And she was warning people against trivializing poverty. She was saying consumption, the ability to consume, is actually a fundamental part of what it is to be a social being. She says an individual's main objective in consumption is to help create the social world and to find a credible place in it. So it's a very humanizing vision of, of, what, of what we are, of what we are as consumers. It tells us that what we're doing here is not just about stuff. It tells us that what we're doing here is about connecting to people, about affiliating with each other, talking to those people that we love, distancing ourselves from those people that we hate, finding a place in the world, finding a meaningful way to participate in society. And this is not just, again, about trivial social advantage. Consumerism is a conversation that can talk about justice. The World Bank some time ago talked about growth as a rising tide that will lift all boats. Justice demands that everybody has a chance to participate in this social conversation. Otherwise, they are condemned to a life with shame. Justice is about consumerism, but it's about reward. It's about rewarding us for being good people, for being good citizens. This is Joss Stone from a few years ago. A car this fine don't pass your way every day. Don't you want to ride, baby? An appeal, actually, to the material object as a signifier, not just of an abstract conversation, but of the most important conversation of all. The one that we engage in as young people, as young adults, even as older adults with the opposite sex, because that matters to us. It matters, in fact, to meet the right person in the right circumstances, to have the right conditions, to procreate the species. Please close your ears, those of a younger generation who haven't got there yet. It will come to you. It comes, I suspect, to particularly this seems to appeal to the appetites of young men. What Josh Stone is saying is there's an opportunity here. Don't miss it by not having the right stuff. This is a quote from a sociologist called Russ Belk, who did a study across three cultures. And uh, this quote, no one's going to spot you across a crowded room and say, wow, nice personality. Having the stuff that signals the connection matters in profound ways to all of us. Consumerism also even addresses this deep anxiety, an almost ontological security, a fear of death. Everything is ridiculous when you contemplate death. And this ontological security is dealt with, or at least we try to deal with it, even through consumerism. Consumerism itself is a consolation. Is this what they mean by the war on terror, asks this young terror. Um, and there is a sense in which it is what we mean by the war on terror, because when the Twin Towers collapsed in 2001, George Bush got out and said, Mrs. Bush and I would like to encourage Americans everywhere to go out shopping. This was the response to the awful circumstances of 9-11 um, uh, in 2001. And it is a real expression of some of what consumerism does for us. It creates a sense of consolation. When my grandmother died, I was asked the unglorified question, what would I like to have of her things? All I asked for was scarves and earrings. And I was so happy when I received them. Others may perceive these as cheap and frail, however, they will always be priceless to me because they hold the most precious memory in the world and represent a love that will never die. Material stuff is not just material. Material stuff is social. Material stuff connects us to those we love and it reminds us of those we have lost. It creates almost what the sociologist Peter Berger called a sacred canopy. It holds meaning together across our lives within society. It gives a framework for saying that life is worthwhile. It allows us to imagine, as the character Big Daddy in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof did, that we may one day, if we buy and buy and buy, and if we buy enough stuff, stuff we can, one of our purchases will be life everlasting. It is, of course, 
a ridiculous consolation. It's a ridiculous idea. We can't take any of it with us. Religion can do a slightly better job of consolation. This is a lovely quote from somebody who was religious. And I wish I could claim so much for myself, but this lovely quotation of a religious woman coping with ordinary troubles, coping with ordinary difficulties, getting through the day, there is this little bit of light. And there on the motorway, there is a cross somewhere on a hill and the light was shining on this cross and I was sitting down there in under the rain. I have a meeting at nine o'clock and I'm sitting down there watching and this light shining on this cross and I say, yes, you are there. There's someone out there bigger than me who cares about me and all the consolation in the world is mine for the taking because I have this belief in something else. And then re when religion is knocked to pieces, in the words of the playwright Bernard Shaw. We are left with a consumer society in which we have to seek our consolations from consumption goods. And consumerism even has, this is a lovely uh, sign in a shopping mall uh, in the UK somewhere, and it says, it, it is an assumption really that we can go on doing this. Paradise is here, not just today, but in the future. And the consumer eschatology, the way it all works out in the end, is to suggest that there is more leisure and entertainment upstairs. Just come up, guys. Check it out here. It's absolutely fabulous. It will be richer when your children are grown up. It will be better when your grandchildren are grown up. This is the promise, the lure of consumerism. It's a social trap that has draw, driven us, drawn us towards an economy that we believe has to grow and grow and grow. For goods to serve the cause of hope, they must be inexhaustible in supply, says Grant McCracken, another fantastic anthropologist who's written about the appetites of consumerism. No wonder when there is so much at stake, our attractiveness to the opposite sex, our friendship with those we love, our sense of consolation for those that we have lost, our sense of promise for the future, our sense of hope in a better world. When there is so much at stake, no wonder it's hard to implement a different kind of economy. No wonder it's hard to even do the simple things like putting low energy light bulbs in that would bring down carbon emissions, getting out of your car and walking when it's a short distance, or putting in some of this brown stuff, which is draft stripping, draft excluder, keeping out the drafts, no wonder it is so hard to do these things which make sense, save money, and preserve the environment. I was reminded of this a few years ago um, by my, my daughter, actually. I was doing some draft stripping. Um, Luftzug in the Deutsch, auf Deutsch. Luftzug, keeping out drafts. And um, my daughter came up to me and watched solemnly for a while. And after a bit, she asked me, Daddy, will this really keep out the giraffes? And here they are, the giraffes. You can hear the five-year-old mind working. Why are there giraffes in the garden? How do they get there? What are they doing there? Will they still be there on Monday when I go to school? And what will be the long-term impacts of having these animals marauding through our lives? Keeping out the giraffes is obviously something important. It's something really important. It matters to us. And as I, as I pondered what was obviously just a temporary childhood misunderstanding, I began to see that actually it wasn't. It was a deep insight into the nature of our lives, much of which is about keeping out the giraffes, getting to work on time, getting the kids to school, negotiating office politics, getting home at a decent hour, having a couple of hours of relaxation, preparing the evening meal, getting to bed in a decent time so that we can go up and do it all tomorrow, and then occasionally being able to dream, being able to dream of a holiday, a time away, a place in the sun, a place with our loved ones, some time with the children, quality time for us, a walk through a cemetery, a contemplation of the bigger sense of meaning that human beings strive for. Keeping out the giraffes is not a bad metaphor, actually, for what is going on in our lives. The story of us as human beings, the people that we have to create a sustainable economy from, and this is a point 
where I have to tell you something about a sustainable economy. This is a picture from uh, a movie called The Road, and it, 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 it exemplifies the fact that much of our vision of tomorrow is a dark one. The movie itself is, is very dark. And it's tempting to think that way when you look at the apparent locked in nature of that social logic, how we're all trapped in it, how it isn't about just about bad bankers and stupid politicians, it's also about us. But I want to finish telling you in something of a role exactly why that's the wrong thing to think, exactly why this vision of tomorrow would be foolish to adopt as our sense of the future. Exactly why there are many, many possibilities for a better world. And exactly why those possibilities start right here with us. Here is something strange in economics. Something that happened in the middle of the crisis. That the saving rate that had been dropping relentlessly because people wanted to max out their credit card in the crisis turned upwards suddenly. A very unexpected manoeuvre. Just this almost 10% rise within a short space of time in the savings rate because of the crisis. What did it indicate? It indicated that at this point in time, people didn't want to spend anymore. At this point in time, people cared about necessity. At this point in time, maxing out the credit card wasn't the point. The point was creating security for us, for our families, for our loved ones. It might seem trivial, but my point is this. This behavior which belongs in human beings, which is a part of human beings, is exactly the wrong thing for an economy to do. So economists, politicians, industrialists, investors, advertisers got out and told people, do something different, max that credit card out, spend some more, keep the economy going. We don't need you to be people with responses like this. We need you to be consumers who want more and more and more. We need you to believe that this is who you are so that we can save the economy. And all of a sudden, it isn't about the economy saving us, it's about us saving an economy that is not fit for purpose. And the more you think about this, the more you delve into this, the more you look at who people are, you understand that we are never, we ne were never, the novelty-seeking, insatiable, materialist, selfish consumers that the system wants us to be. Actually, we were something much more complex. I want to, um, in a festival in a Kunsthalle, I want to talk a little bit about, about art. And this is a picture uh, by Rembrandt. It's a wonderful picture. Um, I don't know if anybody can recognize what the picture is of. Does anybody know this picture and recognize? Rembrandt was very fond by way of, uh, of a clue in painting biblical parables. So this is a, a biblical parable. It's, it's actually the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this is the point, the Good Samaritan is, is here, uh, engaged in financial exchange, interestingly, a part of a, an economy, um, in order to take the man that he's rescued, who's being manhandled off the horse here by a, a complete stranger, uh, into a place where he can be looked after. Rembrandt is a fantastic social commentator. Here is an almost detached figure that you find in a lot of Rembrandt's paintings, looking at the scene as though looking down on it. And here, in the bottom right-hand corner of the picture, is a dog crapping on the street. And what Rembrandt is showing us, in a graphical way, is the range of emotions that live within us as beasts, as those who fall under the misfortune of life, as those who exchange in commerce, and those who do good things in spite of all the circumstances. The range of us between the purely bestial, animal, selfish nature and the almost godlike nature of altruism, of looking after other people. It's a wonderful picture. This one is better. I like this one better. This is um, another sketch by Rembrandt of the same thing. And what it is, what it captures for me is this wonderful moment in which one person helps another person for no apparent reason. 
accept that he's a human being, accept that they are both human beings. And as you think about this and try to associate it with the novelty-seeking materialist consumer that the economy would like us to be, it makes no sense to have constructed an economic system around that vision of human beings because this is who we are, not relentlessly altruistic, not always looking out for other people, but actually torn continually between a self that's, con that's concerned about self and a, and a human being concerned about other people. A person who's relentlessly seeking novelty and a person who's concerned about tradition. A set of tensions in the human psyche I'm continually taught. If you put me in the candy shop and I'm hungry at the time, I will behave like a kid. I will eat all the candy I can get. I am selfish. I will fight to keep others away. In some circumstances, it actually works very well to be selfish. And the evolution, the evolutionary theory tells us that this is how we emerged as selfish creatures. But interestingly, no evolutionary theorist, no psychologist, no sociologist, no uh, faith leader, no poet, no writer, no musician, no artist anywhere would accept that this is all we are, selfish novelty seeking. The only people who do, it seems, are economists. And when you look at this picture, actually it becomes clear what we need to do. We need to dismantle all the institutions that tell us that we are novelty seeking selfish people. And it isn't about restriction, it isn't about saying you can't have this, you can't have that. It's about saying you can be a member of the human race. You can have altruism, you can be other regarding, you can concern yourself with other people. You can think about tradition, you can think about the long term. You don't have to strive for novelty. All of these institutional structures and incentives that push us towards consumer society are basically wrong. They are doing us an injustice as human beings. And once you take this model, once you take this idea and begin to build economics around us, you have another place to go. You have a green economy. You have to do a lot of work, and I'm not going to talk about that now. It's in the book, it's in other lectures. You can think about it again. It'll look a little bit like an economy, but it will have much less lending, much less credit. It'll have much less speculation. It'll have much less stuff. It'll have much more service. It'll have a concept of enterprise where people give their time to improve the quality of life of other people. And that's what work should be. It isn't something that we should sacrifice our lives for, it is something that we should engage our lives in. And the time spent by the doctor, by the teacher, by the care worker, by the craftsman, by the creative artist, by those who rehearse in places like this, by those who make community happen, this time is important. And this is the time through which we build another sense of economy. It means also a different sense of investment. Investment should not be a gambling casino. It should be about protecting the assets on which our prosperity depends. Long, slow capital. Protecting the livelihoods of people, the integrity of environments, and the technologies that we need to do things properly. You also, as it turns out, have to look at money. And I don't have much time to look at that because it's a, it's a shame, because it's a, a fascinating, vital, very, very confusing system. But I would just urge you to go away and ask yourselves the question, where does money come from? And it turns out, although we think money comes from the government and is printed as notes, it turns out that 90 to 95% of money is created out of thin air by commercial banks and charged at interest, even to governments, so that they can invest in the community. It's a deep, deep injustice. Henry Ford once said that if anybody, if the world understood how banks really operate, there would be a revolution before tomorrow. So I would encourage everybody to go out and think about how banks operate, to work on it, and to reflect on the fact that the crisis alerted us not just to an ecologically unsustainable system, but to a deeply unjust and ecologically fatally flawed system. And also reflects on the fact that this system betrayed us. It gave us a false sense of who we are. It told us we are a particular kind of being when the reality is we are broader than that. We do care. We love other people. Love emerges out of chaos. Yes, Thomas Bernhardt, es ist alles lächerlich, wenn man an den Tod denkt. 
Aber auf dem Weg gibt es was Schönes. On the way, there are examples of people doing things differently. Triodos Bank, Spear, a wonderful collective in France, engaging and investing people's real money in the community. An example from the United States doing a very similar thing. Community banking, peer-to-peer -peer lending. Shared interest, the financial vehicle that supports free trade. All of these things are not just examples, anecdotes from from the ivory towers. They are real people right now doing things differently, showing us that another world, a better world, is possible. And here, remarkably, even money itself is being revisited. Not by radicals, not by Greenpeace, not by artists, not by marginals, not by revolutionaries, but in this case, actually, amazingly, by the International Monetary Fund, those angels of change in the modern economy. It is a remarkable moment of time. We have an understanding from the crisis of where we went wrong. We have an understanding from sociology and and psychology of the kind of people we are. We know we built the wrong institutions and we have good examples of building the right ones and creating change. It's left to us, really, to do that. Reflecting, of course, on the longer term, reflecting, of course, on the tragedy of people's lives and how short our existence is and how ephemeral the things that matter really are. They don't reside in material things. They never will and they never have. Boltzmann's life was tragic in one sense, but it was magnificent in another because he laid down the foundations for our understanding of where we are as a society. And it was also magnificent in another sense. He had a daughter, Elsa, who was devastated by her father's death, but found herself, because of those circumstances, befriending one of his PhD students who was also devastated by his mentor's death, Ludwig Flamm. Ludwig Flamm ended up marrying Elsa Boltzmann. Love emerges out of chaos. Order emerges out of chaos. Life emerges out of chaos. All you need to make that happen is high quality energy. And the highest quality of energy of all is that available to us in our creativity, in our relentless search for truth, in our search to overturn injustice, in the, in the, the motivations that we have as human beings to be the best that we can be. And here is a place where we can live a life without shame without the material circumstances that are, that are assigned to us by a consumerist vision of who we are. It is a vision, it is a... It's a task that is about freeing human beings to be human beings. And it's, a one, it's one that, that, uh, that is engaging, that is challenging, that is relentlessly uh, difficult, but in which there are already magnificent opportunities for change. I look forward to your questions. I hope that I've come somewhere in the spectrum of, of, of people. I think I've covered most of them, actually, during the lecture, including the suicides and the survivors. And I look forward to some very kind souls and believers in the time that we have for questioning. Thank you very much indeed. I have the microphone. Are there any questions? <laughs> Probably I should start then. Um, if left versus right is still the par paradigm where we, where we live, um, or in which we, in which in we live, um, where do you locate your ideas in? Um, you presented tonight in relation to this paradigm, uh, if yeah, this can it, be said. It, it, it's, it's very interesting. They don't sit so easily. I mean, they, there are elements of left, if you think of left as being concerned, more concerned with social justice. There are elements of right, if you think of the right as being concerned with individual autonomy. There are elements of both of those things in the institutional changes that, that, uh, that have to be made. Um, if you think about where the resonance for these ideas, where the receptivity of these ideas is in, in politicians, 
Uh, actually, I have to tell you that this work was a report initially for a left-wing government, a supposedly left-wing government. And um, the naive idea that I had uh, that, that we might write this report, give it to them, and they would change was certainly uh, very soon disillusioned. It was, it was not like that at all. These are difficult ideas for politicians of any party. They draw, I think, on... They draw very strongly on ideas about social justice, and to the extent that the left is more concerned with social justice, it probably is more left-leaning than right, but there are, there are lots of resonances too with, with the ideas of autonomy, of community, of the ability to um, be concerned about, about well-being in a way that's broader than the economy that many right-wing politicians would also be interested in. Yeah. That's interesting, I'm just saying, okay. Thank you very much. Um, all the points which you have raised really need a lot of consideration and thinking, and uh, you gave a lot of uh, thoughts. Uh, the, I noted that uh, in the beginning you started by talking about order out of chaos. And it seems this is uh, one of the bases. I would like to know really, uh, what are your standards for order and what is your standard for chaos? Is it all over the world, in all communities, in all societies, the same understanding when you say there is chaos or order? How would you define and how would you be very specific about what do you mean by order? What do you mean by chaos in the economical field? Because there are many schools in this particular issue. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I don't think I would say that order and chaos are the same everywhere. I think what I'm doing by using this, by grounding this in um, a physical understanding, is, is that, that order, in a sense, is, is related to the things that matter to us. It's related to, to prosperity. So, it, so in a sense, it's a question of what does prosperity consist in. And, and what I do, what, what is very central to um, prosperity without growth that is that prosperity is not just income and it's not just material stuff. That we need to create that kind of order because that's actually one of the things that we do, for example, in food is to concentrate high quality energy as food that then we use to live and create the order in our organisms from. So there is order in relation to health, there is order in relation to uh, the organization of society. There's order also, I think, in relation to the more social and psychological aspects of, of um, prosperity. That, that prosperity isn't just about food, clothing, and shelter. It's about uh, friendship, the love of our families, the strength of our communities. It's about um, our sense of meaning and purpose in life. And, and all of these are in a way, a sense of creating order, of creating psychological order, creating sociological order. And they will differ, I think, the right to say that in different societies. But the idea that prosperity is something more than material, and the idea also that we buy this order really only at the expense of the second law of thermodynamics, only out of chaos, and that we therefore need to concentrate, we need to really focus our minds not just on relentless throughput for the sake of it, as though the second law of thermodynamics didn't exist, but on the things that really matter to us, on prosperity in meaningful terms, in terms of the number of children who die in childbirth, the number of children who survive to adulthood, the longevity and the quality of our lives, the health of people through old age and middle age and in youth, the education of our young, the strength of our communities. These are all forms of social psychological order that we risk just wasting if we think of prosperity only as material abundance. So as a playwright or an artist, therefore, are you inured to box office? Have you found a technique for ignoring how many bums on seats? No, not really, and I haven't found that I haven't been inured either to reviews in newspapers, and it's really bothering that you know that these things still matter. Um, one would want them not to. There's a story of a Buddhist monk who who was about to commit himself to a monastery because he because he felt that he had reached a higher higher plane, 
And then he, he met, I think it was in Thailand, and he met the king of Thailand. And when he went to meet the king of Thailand, he found that his palms were sweating. It mattered to him what the king of Thailand thought of him. And so he refused to go into the monastery and he went back into training because actually it was no longer a pure motivation. This is, this is the lure, this is the, 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 the trap of, of any sense of purity of thought, that, that we don't achieve those ideals. We cannot divorce ourselves easily from the thoughts, the cares, the concerns of those around us. And neither can we live without a livelihood. So the answer is absolutely no. I have never managed to inure myself from box office or critics or write-ups. Um, I think I think I would say two things, though, to the to the the implied question there. And the implied question is how the crap do you achieve these things if you're constantly relying on on box office and good opinion? And I, I think I mean I have two responses to that. One is that that in relation to my 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 personal circumstances, I have always done the thing that I believed in. I haven't chased money for money's sake. I have concentrated on the ideas that matter. And it's clear I could have done a lot better if I'd sold my mathematical services to the, to the city or my philosophical services to politics or I had created you know, a strong pension fund that I could have retired on already by now. I, I, would have, I would have been financially a lot better off. But I do think there is a, a part of prosperity is about our adherence to being whoever it is that we are, with whatever the tasks that we come into the world with, whether it's an artist, whether it's a pianist, whether it's a professor, whether it's a diva, whether it's an intellectual, whether it's a beauty, whether it's a poser or a thinker, whoever it is, there is an integrity, I think, that when you, when you put it at the center of your life, it makes those things at least marginally less important. But the other, the other point I would just say very quickly, and I would say in support of what Kunsthaler is doing, and in support of creation, creativeness everywhere, is that it is such a critical component of society that it should not be reliant simply on box office. It should be something into which governments should spend, as they should spend into health, as they should spend into education, as they should spend into sustainability. Culture, creativity and the arts is a part of the glue of society, and so to make it entirely reliant on the box office is wrong. Excuse me, I came late, so I just heard the end of your very interesting lecture. But maybe I can contribute a bit to the left and right dimension. Well, you can talk about hours about what's left and right. You can take a historical way approach. But in a sense, on a more abstract level, the left are able to identify with the weak and poor they can integrate it, yeah? And they are empathetic with people who are different. So they can include the, the other. On the right-hand side, you have people who are very unable to include what's different. They exclude them, the others. They should go home, the poor, they should care for themselves. They identify with the rich and the strong. And this is a more psychological approach, which is the essence. Well, a very, very famous Austrian politician who founded the Social Democrat Party, a physicist, uh, Viktor Adler, as an academic, he identified with very poor working labors. And he tried to make a politic to help them. So this is empathy, and he could identify with the other and the poor and weak. Uh, I, th I think that's. I think that that is certain. I would suggest that's the evidence of history. I think the one thing that. Um, the one thing that changes that, that there was a conception of the right 
which was more egalitarian, that was more concerned not so much with whether social justice was a good thing, everyone, they, they accepted that it was a good thing, but how to achieve it, and, and an argument on the right that the best way to achieve it was through a more hierarchical society, but a, a hierarchy which was concerned with those that were lower in, in the hierarchy. I think that vision of the right is gone. Um, we saw it disappear in my country, really with the era of, of, of Margaret Thatcher, uh, who overturned it in favor of a fierce individualism in which, in which it was everybody's right to compete for that place, but nobody's concerned to make sure that the less well-off uh, were, were looked after properly. And so that, that sense of justice, that sense of being concerned for others, I think has, you're right, been left more to the left than, than the right. Hi, um, I have a question. Um, just, um, you just, uh, just this idea about revolution, if people knew how the banks worked, it would be a revolution tomorrow. And that made me think about um, the current situation, the fact that there hasn't been a revolution, even though in uh, Europe and other places there have been um, national withdrawal your money from the bank day, these things never really amounted to much. So, so my question for you is maybe that's encouraging. People don't want revolution, so they want something else. Maybe that's encouraging for the ideas that you are prom yeah. promoting here. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. I mean, some people do want revolution, that's clear. I don't think I am one of those people. I, I think I want transformation. But I think one of the difficulties with, with, with revolution is that, you know, very bad things happen during revolutions. And there's a lot of scapegoating, there's a lot of punishment, there's a lot of retaliation, there's often violence, people lose their homes, their lives, their livelihoods. It's a, not a pleasant place to be. And so one must hope, I think, that there are forms of protest, forms of resistance, forms of change that don't actually rely on that. And we've seen some of that. We've seen the Occupy movement. We've seen the Uncut movement. We've seen Transition Town movement. We've seen uh, those who are, have been prepared to at least stand up and talk about the 1% and the 99%. We've seen that kind of resistance. And interestingly, we've seen that it has been dedicated to the financial, against the financial system, against the financial system that is unjust. It hasn't still, I think, really captured or picked up exactly how unjust it is and how unjust government's responses to it are through austerity. If you think about what an austerity program is, it's a way of supporting the architects of the crisis while you punish those who are the victims of the crisis. So austerity puts money prints money, creates liquidity, and puts it on the balance sheets of banks and corporations at the very same time that those governments are withdrawing social investment that supports education and health, that supports the poorest people in society, that builds community, that supports culture and the arts, that does all the things that are being asked about. And is that a choice? Is that a political choice? Yes, it is. It's a political choice of the ruling power to distribute money to distribute financial ability in a deeply unjust way and this i think you know this i think is coming to the fore and in a situation in which in the southern european countries for example 25 30 35 percent of young people are unemployed it's a deeply dangerous situation for governments to be in i i, I don't wish for revolution but i think it's inevitable that that there will be protest and i hope there will be transformation Yeah, thank you again. Is there any other? No. Thank you.